room that you see before you is a clock. It was designed by artist Tim Hawkinson. There's a tiny motor behind the envelope clasp, which recalculates this familiar bit of deskware into an almost invisible timekeeper. Hawkinson did a whole series of these. Um, here it's the twist tie, which is moving up. <laughs> here it's the, the uh, pull tab. <laughs> On this hairbrush, there are actually two hairs, which <laughs> And this tape measures time, not space. Hawkinson posits an object world that incessantly keeps time. And it's a world that speaks to me today. Because Barbara said, you have only 10 minutes. <laughs> only 10 minutes to talk about design and the humanities. That's fine. That's perfect even. After all, I am not a designer, but a professor of English, specializing in Shakespeare, no less. I only ever have 10 minutes for design whether that's making a flyer or press kit for a conference, marketing a course or two, or trying to assemble a new group in which to have these conversations. Each of these activities takes more than 10 minutes, of course. But 10 minutes is a handy shorthand for the kind of time recovery program that designing on the side requires. And unlike Andy Warhol's 15 minutes of fame, these 10 minutes for design are largely anonymous and collaborative, products of the DIY kitchen, not the celebrity hothouse. Design happens at the edge of my day, the crust and not the crumb, often before the sun rises. Now, I found those Tim Hawkinson clocks because Maureen Burns showed me how to use art store. And it was Dwayne Pack who taught me how to drag that George Nelson bell clock out of that Corbet Sea. In other words, I owe Humanitech for my precious 10 minutes. Today, as I speak at this conference, and every day when I power up Adobe Creative Suite for an interval of font fun. My latest acquisition is Mason by rogue typographer Jonathan Barnbrook. <coughs> Humanitech has helped many of us grab new skills without ever having to take time off or spend a dime. <laughs> now, for years, I did design for fun, a flyer here, an invitation there. Then I began writing more formally about graphic design with my sister, Ellen Lupton. What unifies all these books, and which also dovetails with the project of Humanitech, is that they all aim to place the tools of design into the hands of anyone who wants to make their mark on the world, whether it's a 20-something who needs a business card, a seven-year-old who's turning eight, or a working mother with social action on her mind. Three concepts that help me think about design in relationship to the digital humanities Designer as author, which really involves designers becoming writers. The author as designer, which reverses that, how writers are becoming designers. And then finally, the fate of the organic intellectual. In the design professions, the phrase designer as author is coming up everywhere, largely to describe celebrity designers with coffee table biographies like Bruce Mao, Stefan Sagmeister, and Karim Rashid but it also refers to the fact that in the open plan, open source, no safety net workplaces of the post fordist information economy, designers of all stripes are increasingly responsible for the management, editing, curating, and production of content, whether it's for a museum show, a press kit, or a t-shirt. Now, a parallel concept for us in the humanities would be the author as designer. Writers inside academia and out have increasingly had to become de facto designers, shaping the look and delivery of our work through fonts, style sheets, prototyping and print-on-demand services, electronic publishing and marketing tools, and so on. And I'm not so much interested here in extreme projects or with the prospects of radically altered scholarly environments, but with the more normative convergence of writing and design within the current environment of what we might call scholarship as we know it, 
while it lasts, as Jim has argued. Not the dissertation as video game, but simply the dissertation envisioned as a document destined for immediate electronic publication. Electronic journals, like Postmodern Culture, are perhaps where we're seeing this convergence most immediately, but we're also seeing it in print journals like Shakespeare Quarterly, for which I serve on the editorial board, where we are using content management systems to draw writing, editing, and production into ever closer contact with each other. With publications closer to the ground, such as custom course readers, or class websites, or collaborative internet projects, where each of us engage directly in the visual shaping that is the design of materials. And this leads me to my third concept, the organic intellectual. Uh, Gramsci coined this term in order to grasp at the, at the beginning of the last century the kinds of conceptual discourses that were emanating imminently from the new industrial sectors, the fiat factories of Italy. In the information economy, everyone with a desk job has to become an organic intellectual of sorts, working with text and image in increasingly sophisticated and demanding ways. In response to this, art schools are beginning to retool their programs to reflect the elastic borders of the design professions. Meanwhile, some writing textbooks are taking a visual approach to composition, and Jonathan Alexander spoke to this in the video as well about this process um, here at UCI. But writing instruction isn't just happening in the university. Groups like Media Bistro are growing their own intellectuals, teaching courses on everything from new media to food writing boot camp. For these middle management virtuosi, writing and design are part of the same great media soup. And at UCI, we've been lucky to have our own media bistro in the form of Humanitech. Here at the School of Humanities, we have many organic intellectuals right on staff. And I'd like to celebrate for a moment the efforts. This is not a complete list, but a group of people that combine the visual and the writerly in various ways. They include Marites Santiago, Beth Pace, Marcy Hogg, Chris Ashen, Catherine Liu, Hugh Roberts, Ayala Amirin, Dwayne Pack, and all of his staff, Maureen Burns, and of course, Barbara Cohen. Now's the time when I'm supposed to say that all of this integration of design and writing is simply exploitation masquerading as empowerment. After all, the post sportist workplace for which we are training our undergraduates simply repackages day labor conditions as creative autonomy, gets the consumer to create her own content and then pay for it and pawns off nihilistic narcissism as social media. Now, I agree with these critiques of our new media economy. The critique is not, in the end, where I want to make my contribution. After all, I only have 10 minutes. <laughs> and I mean this existentially. I'm speaking of the quality of time, not the quantity whether it's 10 minutes or 10 days or 10 years, if I'm practicing design on the fly, underground, after hours, I want to use it for creativity, not critique. I want to use my 10 minutes to build social networks where conversations like these can take place. I want to use my 10 minutes to share my skills with others so that they can build their own world with more grace, style, and sense of moment. I want to use my 10 minutes to bear witness to the social power and visual integrity of type. On any one day, I only have 10 minutes for design. Humanitech only had 10 years to create a space where techies and scholars could share files and share ideas. It's up to us in this room to try to maintain some of the energy that Humanitech is generated, so that we can continue to build a more beautiful, as well as a more integrated public sphere, 
at UCI and beyond. I'm sure that my 10 minutes are up. <laughs>